Dina Okamoto. I'm a sociologist from the University of California at Davis. Um, so in my five minutes, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the issues that have been raised. I'm going to link it to some of the work that I've been doing, but I'm going to talk about it in pretty broad terms just to get some of the ideas on the table. So looking back to what Emily said uh, in her introduction to this panel, um, we often conflate categories and groups, which can be problematic. So groups tend to reflect a shared history and culture, uh, a mutual interaction, and a capacity for collective action, among other things, while categories tend to be imposed from above, often from the state or from some other authority. And oftentimes, groups and categories, as we've been talking about so far, uh, they don't always align or they don't always correspond. And so in my research, I examine and interrogate how groups come to form, so specifically how ethnic groups come to see themselves as part of a broader collective identity. And I refer to this process as panethnicity, and it occurs when these different groups are able to cooperate, um, are able to create new forms of solidarity across ethno-racial, linguistic, and even tribal lines. And it's an important phenomenon precisely because the formation of these new broader identities around which to organize and create new institutions can translate into political power and also social change. Um, and kind of reiterate, re, eh, reiterating some of what Sandy said, uh, panethnic identities are formed through processes of uh, ascription and also assertion. So ascription by the state through race-based policies such as affirmative action, through official racial, racial classification systems such as the census. So this is where the category comes in. Um, and then assertions about a shared history by ethnic group members themselves, right? So this is where the group comes in. So it's this interaction between assertion um, and also ascription. And such an understanding of panethnic identities in this way really um, provides or recognizes the agency that ethnic groups have and how categories, again, which are imposed from above, can be transformed and imbued with new meanings. And so in the US context, um, scholars have documented how diverse groups such as Mexicans, Cubans, um, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans have acted upon a shared Latino identity to strengthen their communities. Research, including my own, has found that Chinese, Filipino, Vietnamese, South Asian, and Japanese Americans have been able to build institutions um, together and new identities to form an Asian American community. Um, studies have also described how tribes in different regions of the US formed a pan-Indian social movement and adopted a pan-tribal identity to organize to try to gain collective goods. So th these are just a few examples um, within the US context. Briefly, panethnicity is also a political phenomenon. Um, it's created and supported by ethnic leaders who are trying to organize their constituents in a political context where numbers are really essential to getting noticed by policymakers and other sorts of government officials and tend to be essential in terms of securing resources. So organizing around a panethnic identity in the public arena is an effective strategy because elites often understand the world in, in racial terms. Um, so, for example, a, an Asian American claim is more likely to be recognized than maybe a Vietnamese claim. So given the political basis of these identities, um, panethnicity can be fleeting once an external threat has been neutralized or once resources have been achieved or gained. So panethnicity is a political phenomenon, but it's also a cultural one in the sense that it can be referred to or understood as a cultural identity uh, which organizes daily life, which people base important decisions on, such as uh, friendships, intermarriage. Um, and studies based on interviews with the sons and daughters of immigrants from Latin America and Asia often reveal that panethnic identities represent a shared worldview, a shared culture, uh, life experiences across different ethnic and national origin boundaries. And so for these respondents, commonality <coughs> with ethnic others in the same racial category is expressed in sociocultural, not political terms. So again, panethnicity is political and cultural. Um, but I should also say that panethnic groupings also represent unequal power relations. 
So dominant groups make decisions about the strength and the placement um, of racial boundaries, defining who has access to opportunities and resources and who doesn't, right? So in other words, dominant groups really place racial boundaries and pan-ethnic groups are really responding to these boundaries. So in the US, when diverse ethnic and immigrant groups organize along a pan-ethnic boundary, this action can re reinforce these racial categories and the larger society will continue to see these groups as such unless ethnic group members are able to shift and change boundaries and to disrupt the status quo. So as institutions and individuals continue to adopt race as a central organizing principle, as race continues to be a key marker of inequality as it is in US society, panethnic identities will continue to flourish in decades to come. Um, but in closing, I just want to say that panethnicity, by studying it, we gain a better understanding of the ways in which categories and groups align. And so thinking about kind of groups, categories, boundaries, um, some scholars have suggested that we really focus on boundaries as a category of analysis instead of ethnic groups or racial groups as a category of analysis. Um, since again, they don't always align. So perhaps that's something we can take up um, in our discussion.